Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Welcome. Thank you. If we could make a start, we've got a very interesting discussion to take, so I'd like to give it the greatest amount of time possible. First of all, I'd like you to welcome our extremely distinguished guests today on the panel. We have Ambassador Sandy Vershva, the Deputy Secretary General of NATO. We have Ambassador Philippe Herrera, who's the Defence Policy Director at the French Ministry of Defence. We have His Excellency Witold Waszczykowski, the Foreign Minister of the Republic of Poland. And last but certainly not least, we have His Excellency Peter Hultqvist, the Defence Minister of Sweden. My name's Ben Nimmo. As you'll see from the wall, I'm a senior fellow at the Institute for Statecraft in London and of the Atlantic Council. For full disclosure, I worked as a NATO press officer from 2011 to 2014. Before then, I was a journalist covering the EU and NATO in Brussels. And before that, I lived in the Baltic States for four years, from 2003 to 2007. So it's a great pleasure for me to be back. The theme of our discussion is NATO in Warsaw, stealing the alliance. It's a NATO summit year. Our focus is on the summit. Things have changed an awful lot, and they've changed very fast. I'd like to just share one memory with you of what was almost my last summit as a journalist. November 2010, Lisbon, the NATO summit. I was there with a team from DPA, the German press agency, and I was there as the Russia specialist. On the first evening of the summit, they approved the NATO strategic concept. For those of you who aren't NATO followers, this is the broad policy document which sets out what NATO thinks it needs to achieve over the mid-term, sort of a 10-year time frame. We journalists got the document. I went through it looking for Russia. And in paragraph 19 of the strategic concept, I read, we will actively seek cooperation on missile defense with Russia. Five and a half years ago, only five and a half years ago, things have changed. And it's not just one change. It's a cascade of change. We've talked about this a lot, but the cascade of change is the world we are in. And I'd just like you to consider five years ago, when people talked about ISIS, they meant the ancient Egyptian goddess. Four years ago, when people talked about little green men, they meant Martians. Three years ago, when people in NATO talked about rap, they meant the music, <clears throat> not the readiness action plan. Two years ago, MH17 was just some numbers and letters. And a year and a half ago, when people talked about Minsk, they meant a city, not a ceasefire. That is the cascade of change we are living in. The world is changing, NATO is having to change. Warsaw, for NATO, is the next step in that chain of change. So I'd like to start by turning to Ambassador Verschbau and just to ask, the world's changing, <clears throat> NATO's having to change. So how do you see NATO changing in Warsaw and after Warsaw? Andy. Thanks very much, Ben. Uh, it's good to see that there is life after NATO. <laughs> uh, but it's great to be back here at the Lenart Mary, Mary Conference. Uh, and indeed, the security environment certainly has changed a lot in the last couple of years. And the summit in Warsaw, I think, is uh, shaping up to be one of the most consequential in NATO's history. Now, we say that about every summit, but I think this time it's, it's really true. Uh, because the security situation did change fundamentally two years ago. Uh, and the Wales summit in 2014 was, in, in a sense, our immediate response. And I think it was a, a strong immediate response. But uh, Warsaw now is where we're going to set the longer term course. We're going to define the longer term strategy for adapting the alliance to a much more uh, challenging security environment uh, than we faced in, uh, in decades, perhaps at any time in NATO's history. We're not going to revise the strategic concept that was discussed uh, early on. Uh, and indeed, some aspects of the strategic concept have become overtaken by events, uh, particularly the Russia portions. But, uh, I think we don't have time right now to uh, spend too much of our 
uh, of our uh, negotiating time on the theory because we have so much to do in concrete terms when it comes to the practice. Perhaps a revision of the strategic concept would be more suitable next year or the year after, after a, a new U.S. administration has come in. But as I said, we will be setting the course uh, for our response to what uh, constitutes a doubly challenging security environment because we are facing strategic challenges from two directions, from the east in terms of an aggressive Russia and in terms of the, uh, the complex range of challenges to the south in terms of the arc of instability, failing states, violent extremism, which is now increasingly having direct effects on our own societies in the form of migration and terrorism. Uh, because we're facing multiple challenges, the mantra these days is that we have to have a 360-degree strategy. Uh, this isn't just political correctness. It reflects the fact that all of these different problems, uh, while they may be of higher priority to, to, to the nations closest to Russia on the one hand or to the southern challenges on the other, but they all ultimately affect our common security and we have to have a comprehensive approach. There'll be essentially two broad pillars in terms of how we're addressing all of these challenges. One is uh, strengthening defense and deterrence, which is more about Russia and the East, but it also applies to the South, where we have to deter threats against Turkey. We have to still be prepared to deal with crises uh, through military means. And the second pillar is what we're calling projecting stability, which is a kind of NATO's terminology for what the European Union calls a neighborhood strategy. This is what what we can do in tandem with other international actors to uh, promote the resilience of our neighbors in the East, Ukraine, Moldova, and Georgia in particular, but also to promote the, the, the defense capacity and resilience of our partners and neighbors along the Middle East and uh, North Africa uh, to help them be more capable of dealing with the threat of Daesh, of uh, instability, weak governance, and the like. Now, let me, let me talk a little bit more about the response to the East. Uh, the summit will, I think, uh, define a long-term approach to Russia, and it will be informed by a very important exercise that's been going on within the alliance, which is to do a comprehensive analysis of Russia's uh, foreign and defense policies. And this has helped, as previous such exercises over the course of the alliance's history have done, has helped to put allies more and more on the same page in assessing the nature of the challenge that we face from Russia. And I think that allies increasingly understand, perhaps much more than they did in the immediate aftermath of the annexation of Crimea, uh, that we're dealing with uh, uh, a Russia that is a, a revanchist power that is seeking to uh, reverse a lot of the post-Cold War settlement, which claims the right to a sphere of privileged interests in its neighborhood, uh, which is, of course, using force to change borders. and. Uh, if there's any doubt about this, it became quite clear when we heard President Putin speak at the UN General Assembly when he held up Yalta as the ideal model for European security rather than Helsinki and the, the principles under, under, uh, contained in the Helsinki Final Act. And let me say, because Andrei Ilarionov mentioned this yesterday, that uh, allies I think, definitely reject any kind of Yalta too. Uh, we, uh, you know, we're not going to war for Ukraine, but we are doing everything short of that to support Ukraine's sovereignty, to help it uh, uh, defend itself, and we will not uh, recognize the uh, illegal annexation of Crimea, and we will insist on Russia's return to compliance with international law, starting with the full implementa implementation of Minsk as the basis for any uh, even semi-return to, uh, to cooperation. But I think even if Minsk were implemented, there's a recognition that uh, we're facing a long-term strategic competition with Russia, a relationship that needs to be managed uh, in order to avoid any uh, risk of conflict, but the days of uh, strategic partnership uh, may, be, may be behind us. Now, what concretely will we be doing at uh, Warsaw in this regard? First and foremost, we'll be strengthening our defense and deterrence posture, and here we'll be building on the readiness action plan uh, and the other decisions taken at Wales uh, and all of that has been implemented very effectively with strong contributions from the European members of the alliance, the spearhead force, expanding the NATO response force, uh, increased tempo of training and exercises, strategy for countering hybrid warfare, strengthening cyber defense, uh, the defense investment pledge. We're beginning to see uh, improvement in defense spending. 
Uh, but Warsaw will build on and definitely go beyond uh, Wales and the key new decision agreed in principle by our defense ministers in February, but now being fleshed out uh, even as we speak, is to enhance our forward presence uh, to add that additional element of deterrence on top of the reassurance uh, measures that were agreed at Wales. The details, as I said, are being uh, still discussed, but uh, the military advice that uh, we're working on recommends battalion-sized uh, battle groups uh, for, the, each, for each of the three Baltic states, something similar in Poland, probably more of an emphasis on increased air and maritime capabilities for the southeastern part of uh, the eastern flank, Romania, Bulgaria, the Black Sea region. Uh, but the basic idea is to ensure that we have some forces in place that are combat ready, multinational, based on a rotational scheme that ensures that even a limited incursion by an aggressor, whether direct or, or uh, through little green men, will be met by a decisive response by forces from across the whole alliance. Uh, we'll build more time for reinforcements and also will uh, be a hedge against uh, the Russians' uh, increasingly formidable anti-access area denial capabilities. Now, along with this, of course, we've pledged to continue to maintain a dialogue with Russia. We had a NATO-Russia Council meeting on the 20th of April. And there's, I think, a recognition that while dialogue is more about managing a difficult relationship, it is essential to communicate our resolve, explain the defensive nature of the measures that we're taking, and to try to encourage the Russians to, be, uh, to, to return to the regimes for transparency, predictability, and risk reduction that they've persistently been circumventing over the last couple of years. At the same time, as I mentioned before, a, a strategy for supporting the countries in between, Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova, uh, and perhaps others, to make clear that we are not going to concede these countries to any Russian sphere of influence, and that we will do what we can in tandem with uh, the European Union, with uh, countries who have strong bilateral relationships, to help them uh, defend themselves, strengthen their resilience, and support the wider uh, reform process, which is ultimately the, the key to their own futures. Part of this will involve enhanced cooperation with the European Union. Uh, we can get back into that more later. Now, let me just fi finish. I know I'm running out of time. Uh, in addition to the strategy for the East, we will also uh, unveil a southern strategy here, I think we're a little bit less uh, well advanced, uh, but there's an increasing recognition that prevention is certainly a lot easier than having to go in with large combat forces to, uh, to intervene in future crises. So, that we're, so we are looking to uh, boost the, the application of our well-established well, uh, toolkit of partnership instruments, uh, particularly defense capacity building to help uh, countries along the Middle East North African periphery strengthen their own capacity to maintain security in their own neighborhoods and to uh, provide the, at least the, 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 the basis for a response to the spread of, uh, of uh, Daesh and other terrorist groups. This could include uh, uh, enhanced defense capacity building with uh, partners we're already engaged with, Jordan and Iraq in particular. We could do more for countries like Tunisia, Morocco, uh, who uh, are you know, still uh, not what one could call failed states, but are struggling to, uh, to fight back against the forces of uh, radicalism and extremism. We could also uh, build on what we're doing now to support the EU's efforts to control illegal migration through uh, enhanced maritime activity in the Mediterranean, perhaps in support of the EU Operation Sophia. Uh, and there may be more that we can do to directly support the, uh, the U.S.-led coalition against Daesh, for example, lending uh, the support from NATO AWACS planes, support uh, coalition military operations. So the southern package is still uh, being worked, but I think that it's going to be important for the cohesion of the alliance that we have not only a strong strategy to deal with the, uh, the direct and existential threat that comes from the east, but also that we show that NATO is more engaged in trying to stabilize uh, this uh, increasingly volatile southern region so that we can live up to, the, to this mantra of the 360-degree 360 360 degree approach, which I mentioned at the beginning. That's great. Thanks. 
Sandy, thank you very much. Um, and, and indeed, the great change we've seen is the 360-degree necessity. Um, you know, there's, the, there's the east, there's the south. In the longer term, who knows, there might be the high north. And it's also always worth remembering that Article 5 of the treaty applies to Europe and North America. So theoretically, someday maybe the west, who knows? NATO isn't just about Europe. Um, but I'd like to turn to Minister Vashtikovsky. And, and coming to this idea of territorial defence, we really are very much now back in the era of territorial defence, collective defence, 28 for 28, all for one, one for all. But it's a very complex environment. So I'd like to ask you, in Warsaw and after Warsaw, how do you see collective defence evolving so that the eastern side is secure, but there's the flexibility so that the southern side is secure and that, if needed, 360 degrees is secure. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for organizing this meeting and inviting me and uh, for these important questions. Uh, the short answer is uh, we would like to, we would prefer to come back to the NATO of our fathers. NATO which is uh, coming back to the roots because uh, the situation, uh, international situation came back to the roots to the uh, 40s or, or, or 50s. Let's start with uh, providing the picture of, uh, of the situation. We have a number of uh, threats and challenges right now. I will, I will not uh, surprise you if I tell you that the big challenge is coming from the east, and this is uh, Imperial uh, Russia, which is trying to redraw the uh, security architecture of the not only Europe, but also the, the whole world. And uh, the second challenge is coming from, from our region. It's just lack of uh, cooperation, lack of cohesion, lack of uh, uh, integration. And this is the challenge we, we, our government right now in Poland is trying to address and integrate this, this region. Uh, the next challenge is coming from uh, institutions we belong to. European Union and NATO. Both these institutions have different uh, ideas and dilemmas right now. Uh, for European Union, there is an important dilemma how to develop, how to integrate uh, itself further. Uh, should we stick to the uh, political union or should we concentrate on economic issues? Should we concentrate how to, uh, how to protect the values, uh, freedoms which are provided by international treaties and especially the European treaties. And finally, there is a dilemma in NATO, how to address these challenges. <coughs> should we provide reassurances or should we provide the presence of and, and deploy the troops in the area which are threatened and challenged by, by, by challenges and threats? Um, I think that uh, the important problem for NATO is right now that we have, uh, after uh, enlargement of 1999, we still have two statuses of security in NATO. It's a different status of security for the older members of NATO and different status of security for those who joined NATO after 1999. And what we expect in Warsaw Summit that finally, this summit will provide equal status of security for all member states. We do not expect, we do not want any privileges. We just want equality. Uh, so NATO, NATO summit in Warsaw is so, supposed to provide this equality. What way? Uh, by deployment, by presence of NATO troops <coughs> on the territory of so-called eastern flank. Uh, Alexander Vesvo just mentioned about the presence, about the brigades, about the deployment. We can disguise the character of the deployment. We can discuss the size of the deployment. But definitely, it's supposed to be a deployment. We expect some presence of NATO troops, of NATO facilities, of NATO uh, defense facilities on the territory of eastern flank. So eastern <laughs> flank will be equal in the security status to the western flank, to the western part of, of, of NATO. 
territorial defense is is important because uh, deployment will be some kind of a token, a symbol of determination of uh, of NATO that in case of any incidents, any provocation, this part of NATO will be defended. So the presence doesn't have to be a concentration of troops to prove that NATO is a, a kind of an offensive alliance, just opposite. This presence will be a token of a determination that NATO is a defensive alliance and is ready and determined to defend this territory. That's great. Brief, short answer. Perfect. Thank you very much. Very well done indeed. Um, so absolutely, territorial defense is back. But as, unfortunately, yeah, unfortunately. Absolutely. But as Ambassador Verschbauer said, there isn't talk of reopening the strategic concept yet. And again, for those who aren't avid readers of the strategic concept, though I'm sure you all are, um, it established three core tasks for NATO, collective defense, crisis management, and cooperative security. That's still valid. So I'd like to ask Ambassador Herrera, particularly as France has been so engaged in crisis management in Africa, in Mali, in cooperative security, France is one of the great bulwarks of NATO-EU cooperation. So in and after Warsaw, how do you see the evolution of those three core tasks? It was meant to be all three tasks were equal. After Warsaw, are we now going to see it's going to be one, two, three, or how do you see the situation evolving? Thank you very much, Ben, and, and I'd also like to say how, how uh, glad and honored I am uh, to be here. You're absolutely right. Uh, the, the, um, the question isn't uh, how can we, but how will we be able to pursue all three tasks together? Uh, and I say this because I think it's indispensable, given not only the current strategic context, but also, as you pointed out, and as Sandy Birschbau did it as well, what's foreseeable. And I think that you know, the, the title of the, of the, the 10th uh, anniversary conference is uh, The New Normal. I, I'm afraid that's a bit optimistic. I think uh, that what we can expect over the next years is that there will be no new normal, at least no stable new normal, but that we will continue, first of all, to meet the challenges and the threats that uh, we're faced with today that are more pressing, more diverse, more intense than I think at any time, certainly since the end of the Cold War, but also even perhaps since the Washington Treaty, certainly in terms of the diversity, and also that we will need to uh, adapt to, to new ones. And therefore, our ability to de de deter and defend, to deter any aggressor and defend our territories and our populations, our ability to intervene through crisis management operations wherever uh, threats to our security may arise from, and our ability to engage with, uh, with, with partners, partners in the broad sense, whether they be countries or organizations, whether they be partners on our side of the issue or not on our side of the issue, uh, will be key. And uh, when I say that the three are important, it means we need to get better at each and every one of them, and we need to do so in a way that these improvements are not mutually exclusive. In other words, I don't think we can afford uh, to, uh, to, to prioritize them, even if the focus, for, uh, for very good reasons, the focus in Warsaw will be on improving our ability to deter and defend, because uh, that's probably the one that we've less focused on in the, the, the previous summits compared to crisis management or to, to cooperative engagement. Now, how do we go about this? I think as far as collective defense, and as, as uh, Sandy Virchbaugh pointed out, uh, our ability to, to, to deter and defend, we need to face the fact that whatever our efforts, and they're huge, whatever our wish, and it's strong, to have a Russia that will return to a path of engagement and cooperation, that's not in the cards anytime soon, for a series of reasons that we can get into in the discussion, but the, re the, the measures we take have to be sustainable over the long term because we need to be credible over the long term. In other words, the success that we had at Newport was uh, not only the fact that we were united in reaching these decisions, but also the fact that the decisions we took were implemented very rapidly and that at the next summit, we're not trying to mask or gloss over what we didn't really do well and 
put new initiatives on the table. We can actually uh, say uh, that you know, we, we said what we did, and that makes it more credible to any potential adversaries that in the future we're going to do what we say. And I think that's important. Second, it has to be sustainable over the long run, because um, if we're only able to implement the decisions for the next few rotations in terms of forward presence, for example, in terms, or in terms of the size of, of, of this presence or the kinds of capabilities we will deploy, then that doesn't make our security move, for, move forward. It actually, uh, 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 I think, makes it more fragile. So sufficiency for the strategic purpose that we're giving to this presence and sustainability need to go hand in hand. France also thinks, uh, and this is something that we'll be discussing in the run-up to the summit and, and at the summit, that it will be important for the alliance to clearly reaffirm the vital contribution of nuclear deterrence to our overall deterrence and defense posture. Since 1999, there's actually been a loss of substance in terms, not necessarily in terms of what we've been able to do, but in terms of what we have said uh, at the level of heads of state or government about what this contribution can bring to our overall posture. And it's, it's important to, uh, to, to, to move forward on that. Crisis management uh, is not behind us. There's uh, a sense that you know, now that uh, the bulk of NATO forces have um, uh, come back from Afghanistan, well, large land-heavy uh, deployments in crisis management are, are, are in the past. It was Afghanistan, it was the Balkans. I don't think we can afford to, to say that or to plan for that in the same way that we couldn't afford to say that or to plan for that after the Balkans and before Afghanistan. In other words, the, the environment that you've described is one where we need to be prepared to be able to, uh, to uh, intervene. Today we're doing it largely in national frameworks or in the frameworks of ad hoc coalitions. If and when allies would decide that it would be uh, their wish to do so in a NATO framework, NATO has to be ready for this. And as far as cooperative security is concerned, uh, here I think that working with operational partners, working uh, with the EU, uh, is not only important because it sounds nice, but it's important in order to improve our security. And if we look at some of the challenges that we're facing in terms of uh, uh, domains like the cyber domain or hybrid warfare, we see that it's uh, even more useful and important to have NATO and the EU be able to, to, to operate together. And I would say the same, and this, this may not be an issue on which we all agree, uh, regarding cooperative security as regards dialogue with Russia. Because dialogue and deterrence or defense are not mutually exclusive. Uh, they can actually reinforce each other. They reinforce each other because through dialogue, you make sure that it's the right message that is being put across. You reduce the chances for miscalculation. Because through dialogue, you make sure that the door for cooperation can remain open if and when Russia wants to uh, walk through it. And also, by doing so, uh, we make sure that we're not handing Putin on a silver platter exactly what he wants and needs vis-a-vis -vis his public opinion, which is uh, uh, the image of a NATO that is uh, uh, closed to any dialogue or, or, or cooperation. Now, we need to do these three things uh, better individually, but we need to do so uh, in a way that our efforts uh, reinforce each other. And for this, I would say that there are three key goals, M better capabilities, more cohesion, and more flexibility. Better capabilities because whether it be at the alliance level or at the national level in each of our countries, none of this can be done without strong, stronger forces and, and more robust and more capable forces. And here again, these three categories are not separate categories. If I take uh, French armed forces, it's the same units, not in a theoretical way. It's actually the same men and women who today are uh, deployed on French soil to uh, help defend against terrorism, who are deploying in and out of Mali on combat missions, and uh, who are deployed in Iraq for capacity building, and who uh, tomorrow uh, will uh, be deployed in the framework of a NATO enhanced forward presence. This is true at the national level, hence the importance of the Defense Investment Pledge 
spending more and spending better, that is to say, on, on equipment and, and investment. And it's true at the, the level of the alliance. And our ability to, to work together through better joint intelligence, surveillance, and, and reconnaissance, our ability to work together not just uh, on land, but also at sea, and the emphasis on the maritime dimension uh, is very important. And overall, our ability uh, to deal with a certain number of challenges like A to AD uh, is important because it's not only an issue of collective defense, it's not only about what's taking place at Europe's periphery, but also in theaters where we may be engaged in crisis management. And I think Syria and, and Russian behavior there was a very good illustration of this. Cohesion, because uh, I think there is a premium today on cohesion, given the pressures we're facing in terms of cohesion between our countries. And I think one of the great successes of Newport, as I said, was the fact that uh, Putin's efforts to divide Europe from America, to divide Europeans between themselves, were not successful. And we're inside the negotiating room, so we know it's difficult to get there. But from the outside, I think what was seen was a strong and united NATO. And this will be uh, essential as well. And flexibility, finally, uh, because given that we're not just faking, facing one kind of threat. Given the fact that uh, I don't think any of us can effectively say what the uh, 15th Lenart Mary Conference will be discussing in terms of threats or, or challenges, we need to be able to adapt to the different missions, to the different threats, to the different theaters we may, where we may, we may be able, uh, where we may need to deploy. The title of this panel is Stealing the Alliance. Out of curiosity, I looked on the internet uh, and saw that the World Steel Association says there are over 3,500 kinds of steel. <laughs> and uh, the best ones are the ones that have both uh, strength and ductility, which for us means resolve and flexibility. So stealing the alliance, yes, but the right kind of steel. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. <clears throat> so we've talked a lot about the global situation, the global implications. I'd like to focus in a little bit now on the Baltics <clears throat> and the Baltic Sea region because it's unheard of. Collective defense is back and the Baltic is really back. The Baltic is an issue in terms of security and that's something which hasn't pertained for a long time. So I'd like to turn to Minister Hultqvist now because the Baltic is vital for security Collective defense is vital for security. Sweden is vital for the Baltic in terms of security. But Sweden isn't a NATO member, and therefore technically you can't do NATO collective defense. So in that context, and in the context of Warsaw, how do you see Baltic Sea security in and after Warsaw, and how do you see the Sweden and NATO relationship in and after Warsaw? Okay. Thank you very much, and um, I am also very honored to be here today and um, had a possibility to talk here. And um, I will try to answer with um, a little more of an overview of the Swedish policy and how we see it from our government, the situation as a whole in the region, and then also say something about uh, what we have decided in our pa parliament as a strategy for the future. We can see that we have the annexation of Crimea, and uh, it's illegal. And uh, from the Russian side, they want it to be in that way, that they, they want to keep it. But uh, the Russian aim, even if it's obvious, is to keep Crimea, that they, we, they also try to get it off the international agenda. And uh, if the time passes, and hope that it simply become a fact of life. Uh, we cannot accept that sort of situation because uh, Crimea has happened and it's against international law and that's the reason why we now have problem with the European security order. We must realize that we cannot forget it. Uh, I was on a seminar this morning and uh, it was a fellow from UK who said that we have some backbenchers in our parliament. They said we have to accept that. We cannot have that approach, because if we have that approach, we accept that to break international law. We, we, we not respect international law. We also see the conflict in eastern Ukraine can be increased or decreased depending on what best serves the interest of Kremlin at any given moment. 
It depends on what they th think they need. Um, the annexation and the Russian involvement in East Ukraine is the greatest challenge we have to the European security order since the Second World War. Uh, Russia's, Russian actions against Ukraine go beyond aggression. They constitute a threat to the right of countries in Russia's neighborhood to make policy choices of their own. And that's also something very important to repeat and say and be very clear around. Because if we stop talking about that, then we forget it and then we will be a part of the Russian strategy. That they must feel that the Western world and the European Union and our partners, we see this and we do not forget. Therefore, it makes our response and our course of action all more important. Time passes and other urgent security issues arise and on our agenda, but we cannot accept what Russia has done. Tension in the Baltic region have increased over the last years. From the Russian side, we see large-scale military exercises and provocative activities close to our borders. Snap exercises in our vicinity have become a regular fe feature. From time to time, we hear Russian officials making statements regarding the Russian nuclear capabilities. Why are they talking about nuclear capabilities and talking in a way that are threatening the world around? They say that you should know that we have it. Why are they doing this? Just recently, we saw unprofessional and dangerous behavior by Russian aircraft in the Baltic Sea, flying dangerous, dangerously close to USS Donald Cook. There are other similar examples that we can see from the Swedish side with our aircrafts. And um, we cannot accept this sort of provocative behavior. It's not, not a matter of nationality of an aircraft or a ship. Such actions must be condemned because they are dangerous, reckless, and provocative. And that um, all of this is, of course, concern to us, and it's important that we respond to these challenges in our region. In Sweden, we have a um, five-party agreement, and we have decided with a broad majority in the parliament a two-tired defense and security policy. From a platform of a non-military alignment, we are reinforcing our military capabilities. We are investing around 10 billion Swedish crowns the coming years to, to, to increase our military capability. But at the same time, we also have decided to deepen the cooperation with other countries and organizations. We deepened defense cooperation with Finland, and that is of particular importance since it includes also planning for an option to act beyond peace. We are planning for that sort of scenarios. We have that option if it's needed. Closer cooperation among the Nordic countries and our solidarity with the Baltic states contributes to enhance security in our region. We are also strengthening the transatlantic link and our ties to the United States. We are working with a program to, to develop that uh, link. Naturally, we also permanently based a battle group now. We are investing in a battle group at the Iceland of Gotland. In addition, we will frequently exercise both air force and naval units as well as ground-based air defense units on the island of Gotland. And that has a direct connection to the situation in the Baltic states, because control of Gotland is very important also for the Baltic states. Overall, we think that a unified Europe is very important. If we act together in a predictable and consistent way, we contribute to peace and security in our part of the world. Sweden also wants to be an active partner in, with NATO in the partnership. NATO has a key role to ensure stability in the Baltic Sea. As a NATO partner, we welcome the increased defense measures taken by NATO in the Baltic Sea region. The United States' presence in the Baltic Sea region is critical and had a clear threshold effect. We are also now in the Swedish parliament working with the decision around a host nation support agreement, and I think that we will take the decision the 25th of May.
so it's very soon. And we are welcoming the US ambitions to increase its presence in Europe through the European Resurgence Initiative. Our partnership with NATO with the Enhanced Opportunity Program as the main platform is important in facing security challenges in our neighborhood. We are pleased to see that format continues to develop with concrete areas of cooperation, such, a, such as early involvement in exercise planning, information sharing, as well as political dialogue. Regarding to the upcoming summit in Warsaw, we believe that the focus should be on the substance, not on the formats. From a point of view, security in the Baltic Sea region is of particular importance. Other relevant topics to address are Daesh, Syria, and Iraq. The conflict in the Middle East, the root causes of the migration flows, and the ugly face of terrorism cannot be stopped without a solid transatlantic resolve to stand up for our values and the stability of our societies. The most urgent threat is Daesh and like-minded terror, terror groups. The future of regional, regional peace and stability depends on keeping European unity. Only together with a unified European response and through a strong transatlantic link can we stand up for common values and principles. I think that I have tried to explain the Swedish position in this, and we think that it's possible to, from a non-allied position, do a lot in practical cooperation. That's great. Thank you very much indeed. Mm. Thank you to all four of you. Um, I'm now going to open the floor for questions, if anybody has a question. Can we have a rough indication of how many people would like to ask something? Okay. Um, so how many microphones do we have? One there? Do we have one on? Okay, so I'll take a question from my left, then from the center, then from the right. This is going to be hard, but please restrict yourselves to one question each. If you ask two questions, then the panelists can choose which one they answer. <laughs> that way we'll get through as many people as possible. So over on my left, please, first question. And, and please introduce yourself. Uh, Ahmed Rashid from uh, Pakistan. Um, uh, Alexander Veshva really um, taking on this nuclear question. Uh, is there a real, um, the whole use of um, uh, the, the nuclear threat by Russia, are you seeing it more than last year or, or less than last year? And, and what is the degree of NATO preparation? How is NATO going to answer this whole idea of trying to de-escalate tension by threatening nuclear war? That was kind of one and a half questions, but we'll let you get away with it. Mm -hmm. Sandy? Well, what we've seen in the last two years is certainly a much more uh, uh, vocal uh, and, and one could even say irresponsible rhetoric by Russia in terms of th threatening to use uh, tactical nuclear weapons. And of course, in their doctrine, there is this notion of using uh, tactical nuclear weapons to de-escalate a crisis. So uh, we're assessing the consequences of this for our strategy. I agree with Philippe that we first of all, I have to remind people that we are still a nuclear alliance, and we will do that at Warsaw, and that we can continue to have a, a nuclear deterrent underpinning the conventional moves that we're making. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we have to mirror image what the Russians are doing, but uh, we do have to at least clarify in our declaratory posture that uh, the Russians should have no illusion that if they were to, to, to use nuclear weapons first in this uh, so-called de-escalation scenario, it would change the whole nature of conflict, and you know, NATO is a nuclear alliance and has the capabilities to respond. So again, we have to convince them that they can't sort of either blackmail us or believe that they could force us to kind of give in through a limited use of nuclear weapons. Uh, beyond that, uh, it's a delicate issue, obviously, but, uh, but, but I think you will see at Warsaw a reaffirmation that NATO is a nuclear alliance and that we uh, remain committed to maintaining the capabilities to underpin that. Philippe, would you like to add something? Or? No, I'd just like to say that I, I agree with Sandy and with Ahmed Rashid that, uh, uh, sorry, and with Minister Hulkvist who also raised this. Uh, we, what, I don't know if we're seeing a greater nuclear threat today from Russia than we did from the USSR during the Cold War, but I would say that we're certainly seeing a more irresponsible behavior regarding nuclear weapons. And this is something that has to be factored in to the way we think about what we say and what we do. And 
not to mirror image uh, Russia, but to make sure that what we say and what we do reinforces on our security and makes perfectly clear to anybody in Moscow who may be thinking about uh, such options uh, that they're not even on the table. Gentlemen, any, anything to add? I'll just briefly that uh, we in NATO do not emphasize that uh, nuclear weapon is a, is an answer. Uh, in our discussions, in our uh, documents, uh, uh, nuclear strategy is a, is a kind of, uh, of a behind argument. Uh, just opposite from, from the Russian side, nuclear strategy is, uh, is forward, is, uh, is a front, is a, is a first answer sometimes. So that's surprising that, that uh, after so many years, when we try to denuclearize the world uh, from, the, from the United States, its uh, initiatives get into zero uh, right now, the strategy, the, 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 the concept. Just opposite to this idea to denuclearize the world, Russia is emphasizing the nuclear strategy is the most important the mo and the first, sometimes the first answer to the, uh, to the problems. Mm -hmm. So we are on a co collision course with, with Russia about nuclear strategy right now. Thank you. Peter? Anything to add? Yeah, I can only say that um, nuclear weapons, it's a very dangerous thing. <laughs> 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 and and if, you, if you use it as something you are threatening the world around with, then you are in a very bad position. We must react on that. It's not the level of weapon you should talk about in that way. It's unresponsible. It's nothing that are acceptable. And, uh, it's also a way that we can see, when you use this language, the problematic situation we have just now in the world and, and what, we, what we need to solve, because we need less of tension, not more. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. So we'll take a question from my right-hand side. Gentleman down the front here. Thank you, panelists. Jarno Limnell, Professor of Cybersecurity, Finland. Um, we are concentrating very strongly now on this physical reality. And at the same time, we know that this digital reality, cyber domain, is going to be strategically more important in the future. Actually, my question to you uh, is that what cyber issues, from your point of view, should be emphasized in Warsaw in, in June? Thank you. Thank you. Gentlemen? Well, I think uh, cyber is definitely becoming increasingly uh, important uh, in terms of our overall defense strategy. And I think we've come a long way in enhancing our cyber defense capability, first and foremost, defending our own networks. We've got a NATO computer incident response center, and we've hardened all the different nodes of our command structure. But beyond that, we've uh, updated our thinking about how Article 5 Article 5 would apply in terms of uh, cyber attacks and making clear to adversaries that they shouldn't assume that just because they don't use weapons, and because the Washington Treaty speaks of armed conflict, that we wouldn't see uh, cyber attacks in some circumstances in, term, in terms of their destructive effects on our societies or our infrastructure as uh, also potentially constituting the equivalent of an armed attack. And we're now, I think, at the next summit, likely to recognize cyber defense as a distinct domain of warfare. Uh, and I think there's less uh, neuralgia about even thinking about uh, uh, offensive cyber uh, as something that the Alliance cannot rule out as part of its broader deterrent strategy. Uh, we need to think of all options to deny adversaries to any notion they could get an advantage over us um, by using cyber or other kinds of hybrid methods uh, that we will also have a flexible range of options available to us. Sandy, thank you. Gentlemen? If I can just add one element to, to what Sandy said, which is that in this field, like in the conventional field, but even more so, none of this will be possible if the allies themselves at a national level don't make the necessary investments in terms of human resources, financial resources, technology, uh, in, into cyber. And that's why one of the reasons why France, along with a small number of other allies, have uh, suggested and proposed that at the summit, leaders also take up a cyber pledge, uh, which won't be linked to, to metrics, but to the commitment to develop their own national capabilities uh, 
the issues that, that Sandy pointed out to at NATO level, at the NATO level, are very important, uh, but uh, none of this will be possible uh, in the place of a, of a national effort. Absolutely, thank you. Well, briefly, okay. I would say that uh, cyber wars cannot be neglected, of course, and uh, in this case, we appreciate the Estonian efforts to build this center here. But on the other side, uh, we shouldn't uh, exaggerate. Uh, in the last three wars, uh, 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 Russia is engaged. They are conventional wars. Georgia, Ukraine, and Syria. They are not using a sophisticated cyber war. They are using uh, simple tanks, planes, uh, green men. Uh, so still, the, the, this is the, the, the most important uh, challenge and the threat right now, not the cyber, just conventional threats. Thank you. We, um I visited the cyber center in Tallinn yesterday, and it was a very interesting information I got there. And um, uh, we have also in our parliament, in, in defense decision I, I talked about um, earlier here, uh, make the decision that Sweden should develop what we call offensive cyber capabilities, because we think that it's necessary to accept that this is a reality and also in a, a way to build a higher the threshold, also develop these sort of capabilities. Thank you. Uh, we had a question in the middle here, lady on the right. If you could raise your hand again. Ekat Kashalashvili, Georgian Institute for Strategic Studies. My question goes to the Black Sea region, which seems to be a bit underrated, relatively so, by the alliance. While Greater presence in the Baltic Sea region is extremely important for NATO, for the overall deterrence and defense posture of the alliance. So is, is the Black Sea area, in my understanding. Over the past years, if we look into the empirical evidence, the real points of friction, political or even potential military, have happened in the Black Sea area. 2008, Georgia, 2014, Ukraine, 2015, Turkey and Russia. So would you think that for any credible deterrence and defense posture for the alliance, there is a need of greater integration of the countries like Georgia and Ukraine in the common effort of the alliance, much alike to what has happened and is happening in the Nordic dimension, Baltic Nordic dimension of cooperation between the alliance and the partner countries like Sweden and Finland. And one, I can help, no, but then no, one very no, small, no, one no. sentence, please. If we get through the other questions, we can come back to you. Um, okay, sorry, we've got a lot of people who want to ask. Thank you. We can come back to it at the end if we have time. Thank you. Gentlemen, so the Black Sea region. Well, I guess I'm going first all the time. Uh, <laughs> we are uh, indeed paying much closer attention to uh, the Black Sea because, of course, this is where we've seen this tremendous buildup by the Russians uh, on the territory of occupied Crimea. It's becoming one, another of these uh, anti-access area denial uh, uh, focus areas. Uh, and uh, therefore, there are new challenges to alliance uh, freedom of movement in that region and to the ability to defend uh, allies who are only a few hundred kilometers away from, uh, from occupied Crimea. And it does also, as you said, uh, under, underscore the importance of continuing to support the defense capacity of Ukraine and Georgia uh, as, as two key partners, and Georgia as, a, as an aspiring member. Uh, so uh, I think you will see uh, plenty of focus on the Black Sea security when we get to the Warsaw Summit. Part of this, of course, involves increased efforts by the states in the region themselves. I think particularly in the maritime area, we have the, some constraints on the, the, the frequency and level of uh, presence by uh, NATO ships from outside the region because of the Montreux Convention. But I think that the, the literal states, Romania, Bulgaria, and Turkey, can serve as, at least as the foundation for an enhanced naval role for NATO in the Black Sea, complemented from time to time by U.S. and other allied uh, naval capabilities. Uh, we we're looking at what are the counter A2AD challenges for the defense of southeastern, uh, the southeastern part of the uh, alliance. And I think involving uh, the armed forces of Ukraine and Georgia, at least on, uh, in some of the activities that we do to to strengthen our presence and deterrence in the region, uh, it'd be a natural uh, complement to all this. So we're, we're 
engaging directly with Georgia and Ukraine as part of our Black Sea review, just as we've engaged with uh, Sweden and Finland in looking at the Baltic Sea security. Uh, so uh, I think we're, we're on the case and uh, you know, watch this space for some decisions at the Warsaw Summit. Mm -hmm. Gentlemen, anyone want to add? Yeah, I, I would add that uh, in, uh, from different uh, points, uh, instead of separating the challenges, instead, uh, despite, uh, I will concentrate on rather the origin, who is provoking these problems. And when we look at the Baltic Sea, Black Sea, Serbian crisis, southern dimensions, uh, in most of these crises, there is a one country behind of them. So let's concentrate how to deal with this country instead of separating the answers and, the, uh, 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 and uh, uh, creating the answers to different regions. Because in, in all of these regions, there is a one country behind of this provocation, in, behind, behind of these problems. I, I agree with that. And I think the, the, the overall answers that we're going to provide are meant to be one coherent, unified strategy, but also we have to recognize that the actual response in different places has to be tailored to the specific circumstances. So I think I don't disagree, but I think there's two sides of the same sure. coin. Peter, Philippe, anything to add? OK, so we've got a lady at the back here. Then I'll go to my front right here, then the gentleman on my left, and then we'll see who else is, is keen. OK, so lady. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Judy Dempsey, Carnegie Europe. Um, since you all, since uh, the, the Polish Foreign Minister and NATO brought up the issue of Russia. Could somebody explain to me why MAP won't be offered to Georgia or even Macedonia and Warsaw? Mm. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> for anybody who didn't follow the Bucharest Summit in 2008, MAP is the Membership Action Plan, which was somewhat controversial at the time. <laughs> so, so. Jens? Well, well, the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia already <laughs> is is in MAP. They've been in it for many years. I think since MAP was uh, conceived in 99, I think uh, Macedonia was one of the first to join. Uh, and regrettably, uh, even though they were considered uh, as ready for uh, membership as Albania and Croatia in 2008, yeah. as you all know, there was a, 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 an additional footnote that they have uh, had to first come to a mutually acceptable solution to the name issue with, uh, with Greece. And unfortunately, that hasn't happened. And meanwhile, the uh, situation inside Macedonia has steadily deteriorated with a real uh, uh, crisis of the whole democratic order in Macedonia and now uh, threatening to set that country even further back. Uh, in the case of Georgia, uh, we addressed this issue in December when we issued the invitation to Montenegro uh, by underscoring that with the substantial NATO Georgia package that we adopted at Wales, with the NATO Georgia Commission, with the annual national program that Georgia participates in, they have all the tools necessary to pursue their membership in a practical sense. Politically, MAP is still out there as something that they, they need to pass through, but I think Georgia can do everything that they could do with, by being in MAP with all the tools that they now have at their disposal. And we will actively help them through the resident advisors, through the Joint Training and Evaluation Center, and other things that we established in the last couple of years to help them uh, reach the threshold uh, of the open door. Mm -hmm. Gentlemen, anyone want to well, ask? Well, we care less <coughs> about terminology, of course, and uh, membership action plan is a, is, a, is a jargon. But we care that uh, NATO summit is supposed to emphasize that uh, open door policy is still valid. And uh, we emphasize that there is no, uh, that, that uh, the third party has no veto to other parties to select the uh, alliance to continue the, the, the pol foreign policy. Sure, thank you. So next up is the gentleman on my right here. Thank you, I'm Ian Brzezinski, I'm a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. I want to follow on some of the comments made about Ukraine. I, I sense there's a major muscle movement underway to reinforce NATO's eastern frontier, defense of NATO allies, but I'm not seeing any significant change that Warsaw may initiate in terms of NATO's relationship with Ukraine. There'll be a symbolic meeting, but there's no, there's no evidence there'll be a significant uh, increase or change or new dynamism to the security relationship between NATO and Ukraine. 
Doesn't this risk feeding an impression in, in Moscow that the West has accepted the reemergence of a gray zone? Won't this risk heightening Putin's revanchist ambitions? Are there things that Warsaw can deliver That's three. to deepen the relationship with Ukraine? <laughs> Same issue. So, yeah. Three questions. One question three times. <laughs> Just about. <laughs> <laughs> things always come in threes. It happens. <laughs> Gentlemen. Three <laughs> questions and no answer. It's, yeah, we, we, yeah. We, we will have a NATO-Ukraine commission uh, meeting at the highest mm -hmm. level. That, 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 that is partially symbolic, but I think it's a demonstration of our continued commitment uh, to Ukraine. And of course, it was the Russian aggression two years ago that created the breakdown in the whole Euro-Atlantic security system. And so uh, we're not downgrading our commitment uh, to Ukraine. We'll also uh, agree on something that's still being developed called a comprehensive assistance package for Ukraine, which uh, will incorporate you know, the ongoing programs we have under the five trust funds, our longstanding support for the defense reforms. We have a large uh, office now of defense advisors who are embedded with uh, working with the Ministry of Defense. Uh, and there may be some new, new elements to the, uh, to the package uh, by the time of the summit. So is this going to be a quantum leap forward, a dramatic change in the level of support? No, it'll be more evolutionary, but I think uh, there will be new elements, and we will be showing that we're not uh, conceding uh, Ukraine to, uh, to any gray zone or sphere of influence. Well, for us, for Poles, this question raised by Andrzejewski is the, the most important. And it cannot be neglected, absolutely. But the problem is that we were, as Poland, we were excluded from the, from the solution. The, the problem to solve the Ukrainian issue, and the, actually, the, the, frankly speaking, the conflict between Russia and Ukraine, the problem was hijacked by few powers. The, 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 they created the Normandy formula, they created the mis Whoops. Good luck. <laughs> they created the Normandy formula, they created the MIST formula, uh, and they are trying to solve the problem. The problem is uh, on behalf of what? Of, of whom? Uh, they, they are not doing this in, in behalf of NATO, in behalf of European Union. This is a self-made uh, formula. And uh, we would like to be part of this solution, definitely. And we are not going to neglect the issue, and we are going to raise these problems uh, also during the NATO summit in Warsaw. Peter, you, you had a comment. Uh, Philippe, do, do, do either you or Sandy want to come back on that I'll leave it specific point? Members of the Normandy format. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I think it's supposed yeah, to be the answer. Yeah. Yeah. If I took it as a question to me correctly, uh, then I think, Minister, that you know, all I would say is, of course, what France and Germany uh, are trying to achieve is not for their own benefit. Uh, it's for the benefit of our common security. And as, as you know far better than I do, uh, diplomacy, international diplomacy, is uh, full of situations where sometimes we do things alone, sometimes we do things as organizations, sometimes we do things uh, in, in smaller groups. If we were able to reach an agreement uh, with Iran uh, on uh, the nuclear file, I don't know if we could have done it as 28 members of the EU, uh, but uh, the, what, the, the what, key what, is... What, what for we created this, uh, this uh, foreign policy instrument? What for is uh, Madame Mogherini? Well, I think the key minister is the combination of, is uh, the combination between sometimes the effectiveness of smaller formats and the uh, the broader dialogue and engagement with with other key stakeholders, and that's the reason for which both bilaterally between <coughs> France and Poland, hopefully from our view in a Weimar Triangle format, uh, with uh, Germany, Poland, uh, and France, with uh, the United States, we uh, we we keep those avenues of dialogue and cooperation and, and, and efficient cooperation open as we move forward in, in the Minsk format. It's not something that we see as an exclusive I'm very format. happy to hear about Weimar Triangle. I'm, I'm, I'm just waiting impatiently for this meeting, which is not scheduled yet. Good to know. I, I'm sure Philippe can, can pass on the message. Um, yes. Uh, under the circumstances, I think Sweden, which has its own history in Ukraine and has its own history with the French monarchy, I think I can pay attention. Well, you know, it's not up to me to say to what in. NATO should do. That, that's uh, number one. 
Then, then I can say that from our government side, it's very important that European Union keep up with the sanctions towards Russia. Uh, and that we have this unity in Europe around this. And this is something we have to discuss all the time in the European Union, so we not will have a split there. That's very important from a security point of view. Then I think it's also very important that all of us keep up, uh, that, that we continue with the contacts with the Ukrainian leadership and that we are there and visit them and uh, have different sort of programs uh, of cooperation. Uh, I visited uh, Ukraine together with the Lithuanian defense minister and uh, met a lot of people there. And what I, the feedback was all the time, it's very good that you are here because that this creates a feeling that we are not alone. But it's not, only to meet is not enough, but uh, to be active and to have programs do things all the time, but keep up with the sanctions. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much. Anything to add? Okay, we had a question down the front here. Then I had somebody in the middle, I'm afraid. I, I have the lights in my eyes, so what I can see is a sea of waving arms, but I can't <laughs> put faces to them. So we'll take the question from Thank here. Thank you, Wes Clark. The uh, question is uh, technology and what we're doing to uh, restrict, if anything we're doing, to restrict the flow of tech weapons technology to Russia. We're in a long-term challenge. We were on the verge of some significant breakthroughs in military technology, high-energy lasers, micro-drones, micro-satellites, uh, probably a lot of other things in the black world that we can't talk about here. But the question is, it's not the Cold War, but what are we doing to restrict technology flows? Russian UAVs got their starts from Israeli UAVs, which got their starts from the United States. Russian tank upgrades got their starts from French night vision sites, et cetera. So what, what are we doing to help our men and women in uniform? Well, if I may start, uh, it's difficult to, to, to talk about technology because we have uh, problems to exclude Russia from the singing festival. You know. <laughs> I would slightly disagree with the Polish minister. It's <laughs> Because it's actually easier to restrict flows of technology than to exclude countries from singing festivals. <laughs> and what we've been able to do, both on the national level, and it's for every country to do, to take decisions, but we've certainly done it uh, in, in, in terms of French export controls, but also at the level of the EU, in terms of the sanctions that were decided, is precisely to re restrict not only flows of technology, but even investment in sectors or commerce with companies uh, dealing uh, with the defense industry. And on this issue, like on a few others, Putin has uh, made decisions that were not necessarily in his best interest because he has cut himself off from a lot of high-tech useful for his defense industry by, uh, through the aggression in Ukraine, just given the, the setup of, uh, of Russian defense industry. So it's, uh, it's a, uh, a long-term effort. It's something that's in our interest uh, given the spread of many of these technologies. Uh, but, uh, but I'm more confident than the Polish minister. Sandy, Peter, anything you'd like to add? No, no I, mean, I, I agree with Philippe. The sanctions are affecting this. Of course, long-standing export control arrangements are still in effect, and key there, of course, is enfor enforcement. And I think there's greater political will in, in face of the challenge we face from Russia uh, in the wake of what they've done to Ukraine to enforce those controls. And so, uh, so, so it, it's a challenge, but I think we're doing what we can, Wes. Great, sir. So we, we had a question. The, the gentleman further back, I think, was first. Can you stand up, sir? It might be easier to, to get the mic. And then we'll go to this side, and then we'll go back to this side again. Uh, Daniel Brössler, Süddeutsche Zeitung. I'm covering uh, NATO in Brussels, and I have a question about uh, the NATO-Russia founding act, which, of course, leaves room for interpretation. You get the impression that the founding act is mentioned more often in some NATO countries than in others. And uh, that's why I'd like to ask you to what degree you would say the founding act influences the debates when it comes to forward presence ahead of the NATO summit in Warsaw, and uh, to what degree it actually should guide the debate or shouldn't. Thank you. Thank you. Founding Act. 
Well, it's, a, it's important to remember what the NATO-Russia Founding Act is. It's a political document. It's not a legal document. And the particular issue I think you're referring to is this uh, pledge, which was a unilateral pledge by NATO even before the Founding Act was signed, uh, regarding not deploying, not permanently stationing substantial combat forces uh, going forward. Uh, that was meant to be in the current and foreseeable security environment, so there is at least a, a case that could be made that uh, the world has changed and we don't need to be bound by that. But nevertheless, the Alliance has not uh, chosen to debate that issue, but to focus on whether we can do what we need to do in terms of strengthening our defense and deterrence posture within any reasonable interpretation of the Founding Act. Uh, and, I th and, and the short answer is we can. The, the kinds of uh, deployments uh, we're talking about that are rotational, they're not permanent, but even if for the sake of argument you, as the Russians do, say that permanent and persistent are, are the same thing, uh, the levels that we're contemplating are still well below any reasonable definition of substantial combat forces. We're talking about battalion-sized formations uh, in, uh, in the eastern countries. Uh, in the course of uh, discussions over the past 20 years, the Russians have advanced a number of proposals trying to define substantial combat forces, which we never agreed to, but the Russians' own proposals spoke about a combat brigade per country as being their uh, proposal for substantial combat forces. Some of this is even you know, available on the public record in terms of proposals that they made in uh, various stages of the uh, of negotiations in the, the joint consultative group in Vienna. So. Uh, we believe that what we're doing is proportionate, it's defensive, and it's well within any reasonable definition of substantial combat forces. Uh, what the Russians are doing, on the other hand, could be seen as violating their reciprocal pledge in the Founding Act to exercise similar restraint. There's been this major buildup in Kaliningrad in terms of the A2 AD capacity. We've heard, heard uh, announcements of uh, additional divisions being established along their western frontiers. Uh, so let's, let's look a little bit more closely at whether the Russians are adhering to their side of the bargain. Uh, but NATO, I think, uh, is staying well within uh, any reasonable interpretation of the founding act. Minister? <clears throat> no, I'd just like to add very briefly one point to what Sandy said, which is that we did not even commit to not deploying substantial combat forces in the current and foreseeable strategic environment. Uh, we stated that it was better to pursue our security through more deployable, more capable forces, then through deployment of uh, substantial combat forces. So we didn't even exclude it. But more to, to the point of, of your question, sir, I think that if our goal in Warsaw is to maintain our cohesion and project <coughs> unity and strength, then it's not helpful to put questions on the table that will be divisive by nature, because we will not get agreement to say the NATO Founding Act is a piece of paper that we've torn, out, torn, torn up and thrown in the wastebasket. We will not get consensus to say it's uh, the key framework in which we're operating and the legally binding constraint that we need to respect. So we should agree, as we did in Newport, where this question was already asked, to say that uh, if we're going to say something about the Founding Act, that it's the spirit of the Founding Act and the one uh, that we had at the time in terms of NATO-Russia cooperation that we would like to get back to, that we're free, that, to, that we're willing to do so. Russia is not, but it, it's still there, uh, rather, than the, rather than the specific constraints, uh, which from our point of view, as Sandy said, uh, aren't the issue at hand. Mm -hmm. Minister? Yeah, if I may add to, to this first, uh, as uh, Sandy Vesro mentioned, uh, this is uh, politically binding. It's not a legally binding document. That's the first one. The second, it was created in 1997 before NATO enlargement. So it was a political pledge by former NATO, not the NATO we are right now in, in as a member. So we do not feel to respect this document. I, I know what you say. The you, second, the second you, problem. New members accepted the body yeah, of I, decisions leading up to. But their that's election. a political declaration. <laughs> it, it, it's not a, decisions. Uh, a, not this is this is not a commu the, the, the communitaire of NATO. This is not a communitaire. The second problem is 97. Let me remind you, 97. It was a different situation in Europe, different Russia, Yeltsin Russia, not so aggressive. 
Since 97, we have a Georgia war, Ukraine, Syria, uh, uh, engagement of Russian uh, uh, planes in, in Baltic Sea, uh, and things like that. So I, since that time, Russia violated UN Charter, international law, Budapest Declaration, bilateral uh, commitments, everything was violated. And we still stick before, because of this, despite of this violation of the, of, 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 from Russia of the international law, we still stick to this political declaration. Why? Thank you. <clears throat> On the clock, we've got three minutes left. I've just been told we can have five minutes extra. What I'd like to do at this point, I saw we had a question right over at one end, a question on the other, and a question in the middle. If each of you could all ask your questions now, we'll do a package of three questions, and then we can talk out our time. I think that's going to be the most effective way of doing it. So, sir, on my right here, a very short question. Thank you. Yari uh, Krivoy, Belarus Digest. Uh, Belarus is located between the Baltic states and Ukraine. And I know that uh, Minister Wyszykowski recently went to Belarus and had high-level meetings there. There was a delegation from the U.S. Ministry of Defense. So is there a new perception of Belarus? Is there something changes as far as Belarus is concerned? Thank okay. you. So new perception of Belarus. Sir, at the back. David Kramer with the McCain Institute. The question is for Sandy. Uh, Sandy, as you know, U.S. military and even diplomatic officials are losing patience with Russia's dangerous and provocative buzzing of U.S. planes and ships. What is NATO doing to prepare for the possibility if the United States, after warning Russia about this, has to shoot down a Russian plane? <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you for, for, for that Tom Clancy scenario. Uh, <laughs> sir, down the front here. That's a good question. Uh, good morning, Marcus Hick from uh, Industry Thales. Uh, simple question: What the risk you see if and when Sweden and Finland will join NATO as a full member? Okay. Thank so, so very briefly, we had: Is there a new relationship with Belarus? The possibility of a shootdown, and the risk of Sweden and Finland joining. Very briefly about uh, Belarus, I don't know if there is a new perception in Minsk about the foreign policy, but there is a definitely a new perception in Poland because of a new government uh, towards, towards Belarus. There is an opening and, of course, uh, without the preconditioning, uh, we will try to open all the, uh, all the uh, channels of dialogue with uh, Belarus and keep Belarus as, uh, as close as possible to, uh, to Europe. Sure. Peter, do you want to take on Sweden, Finland, NATO, your favorite subject? Yeah. Um, and do you want to do it in about 1 minute 30 seconds, just okay. to make it even more fun? I don't know if uh, to say risk, but uh, if I say it like this, uh, the government I represent, we will not apply for be a member of NATO. We will deepening and uh, try to develop the partnership. That is our position. And, uh, I cannot answer for Finland, but uh, my relationship to Finland says me that uh, there is not on the agenda there either. So, so we have the same position of, of uh, non-alignment, and that is our platform for this uh, develop our partnership. And, and uh, we have that ambition both of all countries. Mm -hmm. Philippe, do you want to take on any of these? Well, I just wanted to add a point, if I may, to what Minister Hulkvist said on the so-called risk. I think that what Minister Vashikovsky underlined is very important. Uh, and it seems obvious, but sometimes obvious things go better said than unsaid, which is that no country holds a veto right uh, over the sovereign choices of countries who would want to apply to, to NATO. So I understand this is not the case, but nevertheless, given Russian threats and intimidation, in this case, uh, uh, backed by nuclear saber rattling, uh, it's uh, important that uh, that um, there are no misperceptions uh, here. And uh, I, uh, for myself, would certainly not speak of a risk, but rather of an opportunity. Certainly, in terms of the uh, increased cooperation that we have today with uh, Sweden and Finland. And Sandy, the fun question on the shoot down. <laughs> okay. Well, two words on, on Belarus. Uh, we've noted their increased interest in kind of re-energizing their partnership with NATO, but we also get mixed signals. We did have a working-level delegation that went to Minsk a few weeks ago, and kind of they had some positive engagement. And in, in other places, the doors were slammed in their face. So we, uh, but nevertheless, uh, you know, they are eligible to uh, develop their partnership with NATO, just like any other uh, uh, sovereign state within the Euro-Atlantic community. Uh, on, on Sweden and Finland, uh, if any, a future, future government uh, 
were to apply, and uh, I think that application would probably be well received. Uh, I think in the short term, it would obviously lead to lots of uh, histrionics from Russia and maybe even uh, tangible steps to raise tensions in the region. But I think ultimately, uh, uh, this would pass, and we would have a more stable and more coherent approach to security in the Baltic region, among other things. Uh, on David's question, well, I, I, the short answer is, you know, NATO's always ready for anything. Uh, uh, but what we're trying to do is, uh, is to be more proactive, but we're not getting very much uh, satisfaction from the Russians, is to develop a dialogue on how to avoid incidents like that by increasing transparency, predictability, beefing up uh, existing instruments like the uh, Vienna, do Vienna document so that there's more advanced notification and transparency regarding military exercises so that uh, the chances of such a, uh, a, a serious incident actually occurring would be uh, minimized. Uh, so far, the Russians don't really want to be transparent or predictable, but hopefully in time, and, and it won't take an incident like the one you described to get them to be interested, and hopefully they will recognize that uh, in this current situation, it's in both sides' interest to uh, minimize the chances of an accidental uh, incident escalating into a full-fledged conflict. Jens, thanks very much. We've got about two and a half minutes left. I have one question here, very, very, very brief. And an uh, the lady from Georgia, <laughs> you can fit in your, your one-minute question if you can cut it down to half a minute. Okay? So, sir, <laughs> Thank you very, much. very quickly. Uh, Matt Bryce, a senior fellow at the Atlanta Council, also ICDS. Um, Shoot-downs. Turkey happened. Uh, I live in Turkey. Uh, for a long time, there was great ambivalence in Turkey question. about... Question. Solidarity with NATO. It's coming. Got to it set it up. It needs to come now. Therefore, how does this play over into NATO's planning and thinking, especially when everybody sees Turkey maybe gaming the EU on migration? Thank you. And Madam, half a minute. Mike coming. Yeah. Agree with Philip Herrera on, on when he said that um, it's important to say to do what is being said to be done. Georgia's membership to NATO is the same question or not, in your understanding of credibility of NATO, to deliver on the membership of Georgia, ultimately, as much as it has been promised in 2008. Lovely. Thank you very much. Gents? Brief answers? Well, uh, what happened with the shoot-down in November of the Russian plane by, by Turkey, which uh, was uh, based on uh, an actual violation of Turkish airspace by the Russian, and it was by the Russians. It wasn't the first time that happened uh, during their Syria operations. That reinforced the effort that I just described earlier to try to kind of convince the Russians that it's in their own interest to develop better mechanisms for uh, for risk reduction than we uh, than we have now. Uh, it uh, it also underscored uh, that this whole question of defense and deterrence uh, is not only about the eastern flank, but it's about our southern flank as well. To some degree, the Russian intervention in Syria kind of caused things to blur as to be to, between the threats from the east and the threats from the south. Uh, and on the second question, uh, I, I think ultimately, yes. Uh, NATO made a very explicit promise in 2008 that Georgia will be a member of NATO. And uh, there was no timeline attached to that. Uh, but uh, sooner or later, NATO uh, has to deliver as long as Georgia continues to demonstrate through its own efforts, that it uh, meets the standards of NATO membership. Obviously, it's a challenge uh, when it comes to applying Article 5 to Georgia, just as we're addressing it in the context of uh, the defense of, uh, of the three Baltic states. Uh, but sooner or later, NATO will have to come to grips with that. Any last thoughts, Jens? Well, full support for Turkey position. I had the chance to, to visit Ankara a couple weeks ago, uh, talk to all of these important people, like uh, Davut Oglu, like Erdogan Gan, and others. Uh, and uh, in a few weeks from now, we will organize in Warsaw also trilateral consultation with Romania and Turkey about these international issues. Mm -hmm. Thank you. No. I would just add that, uh, as far as Turkey is concerned, uh, of course, it's, it's um, gotten higher on the agenda uh, in the last few months, and in particular since uh, November and, and the shootdown in terms of tensions with Russia. But allied solidarity with Turkey and, and actual reinforcement of Turkey's defenses is not new, uh, going back to the decision on air defense and, and the Patriot deployments uh, two years ago already in relation to the, uh, the crisis in, in, in Syria. And as far as, as Georgia is concerned, I, I think that what Sandy said is very important. I mean, there is a pledge, a commitment 
by allies in Bucharest that Georgia will become a member of NATO. But I think Georgia, or at least uh, the Georgian government, understands very well that one of the key and precious assets that it has is that this was a decision taken at 28. While there was not a consensus on the map per se, and therefore everything we can continue to do to enhance the partnership uh, with Georgia in the defense field, I think will be beneficial as we move down this path. Uh, and uh, in terms of uh, French contribution, uh, we've taken up the lead on the air defense uh, package of this, uh, this, uh, this overall uh, um, substantial package. Georgia is doing very important things in terms of the alliance's missions in Afghanistan, but more broadly in terms of Europe's security by contributing to uh, EU missions, uh, for example. And here again, I think that keeping this consensus on the way forward is uh, more important, or at least is, is extremely important, rather than putting divisive questions at moments in time that won't be helpful in any case to Georgia. Thank you very much indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, a big thanks to our panelists.